Hello everyone, uh, this is going to be our fourth video, uh, fourth topic, uh, and I'm going to make an asynchronous video for this one. Uh, I always like to start by talking about my why as to why we're making a video for this one. I've got a couple of reasons. This should be right in the middle of a big set of lessons. There's usually five that I do together. And um, the first couple lessons are all about harmonic motion, which is things that are going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and we've discussed those already. Those are pendulums and springs. They undergo harmonic motion. Um, but periodic motion is a bit of a broader term for that. Periodic motion is anything that's repetitive. And another type of repetitive motion is circular motion. And so we're kind of covering everything that's kind of going in circles and everything that's going back and forth. And since right now we've finished covering harmonic motion and we're now going into things going in a circle, um, I kind of thought this would be a good time to do a YouTube video. It gives us a little bit of flexibility so that if you want to work on other tasks, you can watch this video at other times. And uh, really the plan is uh, the next day, tomorrow, whenever it is we do this, we're going to do topic five on Kepler's laws. We'll do that one as a group lesson and we can kind of do a recap as a group as to what we've learned from circular motion. But hopefully by making this video asynchronously, there's some flexibility so that you can watch this on your own time, uh, either before class or after class. And it may give you time during class to work on other things. Or um, it just gives you the, the flexibility to just pause my video, like I've always been saying. And then that way you can stop, rewind, you can ask questions, and you can go at your own pace rather than going at the group's pace. So anyway, without further ado, let's talk about circular motion. And uh, hopefully you've already seen this before, because circular motion or periodic motion, anything that's going back and forth or around in circles, has this wave concept to it where it goes up and down and up and down. And for anybody who's taking Math uh, 30, any Math 30 course, dash 1 or dash 2, you'll eventually learn about the graph of y equals sine x. And that's more or less what this graph is right here. This is a sinusoidal graph. This is technically not the sine graph. This is not officially y equals sine x, but it's, it's, it's more or less the same thing. Um, this is technically a graph of y equals cosine of x, just to be more specific. Um, but they're, they're, they're very much related to each other. And so what I want to discuss over the next few pages is what happens when we take something that's no longer in harmonic motion going back and forth, like your pendulum. And this picture right here is what we've been focusing on, a pendulum, right? Pendulum going back and forth, back and forth, swinging back and forth. And this is a good free body diagram where if there's tension going in one direction, force of tension, force of gravity is pulling it straight down, but uh, there is a restoring force in here that's pulling the, the pendulum kind of to the side, right? And hopefully you're familiar with how we got that force. It's by breaking up the force of gravity into the F gravity Y direction, the F gravity X direction. And really this restoring force right here is the X component of gravity. Well, what we're suggesting right now is let's make that restoring force so large that rather than something swinging back and forth, that it then just continues going in a circle. Because really, isn't that what a pendulum is doing right here? If, if we've hopefully already done a lab on pendulums, right? a pendulum is basically swinging according to a half circle, or at least a part of a circle. Uh, the word we use is an arc. It's basically swinging along an arc length. And as it swings along this arc length here, it may eventually come back and forth and back and forth, but it may go in a full circle. And uh, that's basically what we're now branching out into, is let's put things into circular motion. And this is the big note here. Rather than starting and stopping, though, objects in circular motion should have a constant speed because they're, they're constantly in motion. They're constantly moving, right? If they didn't have a constant speed, then what would end up happening is they'd either stop or they'd start or they'd slow down or they'd speed up or they'd go another direction. Um, to kind of give a few more visuals of this concept, again, this is the idea of your spring, right? Your constant spring, your spring that's oscillating up and down. And um, I don't really have great lab apparatus to do a spring going up and down. There's just too much friction to measure it fully. But um, there, there's an example in one of our labs where there's kids bouncing up and down on a trampoline. And that, that can kind of follow this motion, right? Up and down, up and down. Same thing with like a wave pool. Well, what I'd like to do is show you how this motion of this going up and down and up and down is very similar graphically to how a wheel spins around in a circle. And this is a very similar concept to anyone who's taking a dash one or dash two 30 level math course. Uh, if you haven't already, that's fine. You probably will at some point in your lives. But kind of imagine that this right here is the starting point of the wheel. We'll, we'll, we'll put it right over here at zero. That's normally how we do this traditionally, right? And what you could then consider is your y height value, basically, right? And so right now, we've got our wheel at what we're going to call the zero marker, right? But eventually, if you were to rotate this wheel, let's say it's going in a, uh, what does that make of that? That makes it a clockwise value. If you were to rotate this wheel in a clockwise value, oh no, that's counterclockwise. Ah, take it back. This is counterclockwise. Sheesh. 
if you were to rotate this in a counterclockwise fashion, well, this spot right here would eventually rotate up to there. And it would eventually rotate up to here. And so that's what we've got right here, is that this spot right here translates there. This spot translates to there. And eventually this top of the wheel translates up to there, right? Then eventually the marking goes back down, which is kind of what this one shows. And eventually it goes back down until it's basically right back at its equilibrium point. And then from there, then it goes into the negative section. And so that would be this point coalescing with this one. Uh, you'd have a point right here that correlates there. This point right here matches up there. And then uh, finally the wheel, wheel begins its upswing again. And so some points over here become these points here. And uh, maybe the best example I can imagine is imagine you had like a, a piece of chalk that you marked on one of your tires. And then as your tires spin around in circles, the marking on the chalk basically is in a new location. Sometimes it's above the equilibrium point, like this point and this point up here. They're above the equilibrium points, right? Flat across is equilibrium. Sometimes there's points that are below the equilibrium point, which is over here. And so that's the cool thing, is that the, the spinning of a full cycling wheel actually has a very same graphical kind of motion as the oscillating back and forth pendulum or as the oscillating back and forth spring. And so that's why I put these units together. Now, for some background um, theory that we need to understand, uh, although objects that are going in a circular motion, they should have a constant speed. Because, I mean, keep in mind, if they don't have a constant speed, eventually they're going to slow down and stop, right? We want to make it so this thing just keeps spinning in a circle continuously at, say, like 100 revolutions per minute. If it's not traveling 100 revolutions per minute or 60 hertz or some sort of frequency that is constant, if you don't have a constant frequency, then eventually it's going to slow down and stop. Or if you don't have a constant frequency and you keep speeding up, it's going to go faster and faster and faster and probably spin out of control. So we want to have a constant speed. However, we're not going to have a constant velocity. And the reason why you don't have a constant velocity is because the direction you're traveling is always changing. And if you recall from earlier on in our year, a velocity has both a magnitude and a direction. And because of that, if you're going in a circle, your direction is always going to be changing. And I like this diagram to help illustrate it. As you spin this thing in a circle, the direction that the red object is, is moving is more or less directly to my right. The idea is you draw a tangent, and that's more or less at this one moment of time. That's the direction that the red pendulum is moving. But as it gets pulled kind of in a circle, eventually it's going to start moving this direction. And eventually the pendulum will be over here and it will move down. And then the pendulum will move over to the left. And eventually the pendulum will be moving up. right? And it's really not a pendulum anymore because it's spinning around in a circle. And because the directionality is constantly changing, we don't have a constant velocity anymore. We have a constant speed, but not a constant velocity. And so we have a different set of terminology we use for this. We say because our instantaneous velocity is always tangent to the circle, what we really have is a circular velocity. And we often represent this with the letter V with a small c. And if you have your formula sheet nearby, uh, you'll hopefully be able to find a few locations where we have V with a c. And the c basically refers to the fact that this is now going in a circle. And that's really important. Well, one step up from velocity in a centripetal direction, in a circular direction, is acceleration. And therefore, there's also acceleration in a, in a circular direction. Because if the velocity is always changing, because we always have a new direction that we're going, there's actually what's known as a circular, or sometimes we use the word centripetal, centripetal acceleration. And so it's not because the value is different, right? This thing could have been going 50 meters per second right here, and it's still going 50 meters per second right here, and it's still going 50 meters per second right here, and it's still going 50 meters per second right here. It's, it still has the same speed. But due to the fact that it's changing its direction, any change in a direction will cause a velocity. And any change in velocity over time will now give you an acceleration that's centripetal. And um, that's what we kind of want to focus on, is we've got some new formulas we're going to use now for anything that goes in a circle. Uh, one last point before I change slides here. If there is no acceleration, the object would travel in a straight line. Imagine that you were to spin something around in a circle, and all of a sudden the line were to snap. Well, this object would then fly off at a tangent because Newton's first law, objects in motion stay in motion. But we actually have a force, 
and it's called the centripetal force, a circular force. And that force is constantly pulling the object towards the middle. The tension in this rope is constantly pulling back towards the middle. Because if it didn't pull back towards the middle, this thing would then fly off in another direction due to Newton's first law. So I'm going to keep describing this over the next couple of slides, because I'm, this really just is the same thing said a few times. So let me try another picture here. Imagine this is the center of a circle that you're rotating something around. And I guess we're rotating it. Uh, this is counterclockwise again. Apparently I've got my directions wrong. This is counterclockwise, right? We're spinning something around in a circle. Well, the way this would work is that your velocity at one point in time is actually on a tangent. It basically is if you snapped this rope right here, a tangent, if you recall, is basically where the, where the graph just barely grazes a curved axis. We did this earlier in the year with graphing, where you have, if you had like a curved graph, a tangent is one that just barely, barely, barely touches the axis right there, right? So if we do that same tangent concept right here, the, um, the, 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 the rope would, if, if the rope ever snapped, this object would go flying to my left. And if it was right here and you let go of the object, even it would go flying downwards or off at an angle, right? Well, if it wasn't for the rope or whatever it is keeping it going in a circle, this thing would, this thing would keep going in this straight line direction which means we must have an acceleration. And the acceleration is always towards the center of the circle because it's trying to pull you towards the middle, right? You want to go this way, but the acceleration pulls you that way. And that explains why eventually you're now going this way for a while. But at this point right here, the acceleration wants to pull you towards the middle. So eventually you'll be going up, but your acceleration is pulling you towards the middle. And so due to that, eventually you will be pulled that direction, right? Hopefully you can kind of see how I'm doing this. I'm going to try this one more time, maybe with some different colors, just to, just to make sure that you get this concept here. But our acceleration is always the change in velocity, right? And a change in velocity indicates that, like, well, this is the new direction you're going to travel. So let me try this from the top here. This object right here wants to go that direction right there. Right? But because of that, it's actually getting pulled towards the middle by an acceleration. And that middle pulling acceleration will eventually cause the object to go down. It takes a little while for it to rotate that 90 degrees, but eventually it will now be traveling that direction, which is straight down. But what we've discovered is that acceleration is always pointing towards the middle. So if I have an acceleration pointing towards the middle, this means that I, my, my object wants to eventually pull that direction. And so eventually the object will get pulled that direction. Right? And then what ends up happening is, well, there's an acceleration right here that's always perpendicular. It's going to pull it towards the middle. Right? And what ends up happening is eventually at this location over here, your object will be traveling up again. But then you'll have a velocity that is pulling you towards the, sorry, not a velocity, an acceleration that is trying to pull you towards the middle. And as it tries to pull you towards the middle, eventually you'll actually be going towards the left again. And that explains kind of in a pictorial format how all of these accelerations and velocities work. The idea is that they're always at a right angle to each other. And that's what gets this direction right here to eventually go that way here. Now, you might say, Chris, why does it have to be pulling towards the middle? Well, let, let me see that I can try to describe this otherwise. Let's say that right here, you were traveling along the purple line, but the acceleration wasn't going towards the middle. Let's say the acceleration was going outwards. Well, then that would mean that if the acceleration was going outwards, eventually this thing would be wanting to go in an up direction, right? And what would happen then is it wouldn't follow this trajectory. It would then start going this way. But that wouldn't make sense because that means this thing is like flown off course and we know that it's planning on going in a circle. So the only logical direction for my acceleration is that eventually it's going to go this way, right? Eventually it's going to turn towards the downwards direction in order to maintain its circular motion. So if it's about to go in the downwards direction, it means my acceleration was down. But eventually my acceleration will be in, and eventually it'll be up, and eventually it'll be back in again. And so what we've discovered is that it's center-seeking. That's the word we use, center-seeking. It's actually where the word centripetal comes from. Whenever something is going in a circle, the acceleration always wants to pull you in towards the middle, which is good. Let me point out another example as to why this is really relevant. Our sun, this is a sun here, oh my goodness, that's the sun, is at the center of our solar system, right? And we know that we have planets, Mercury and Venus and Earth 
And all of these planets keep going in a circle, right? They all go in circular orbits. They actually don't. They go in elliptical orbits, but we're going to talk about that tomorrow with Kepler's laws. Well, one of the reasons why this is really important is that as these things go in orbit around the sun, they're being held inwards by an acceleration, and that acceleration is gravity. Because that centripetal acceleration that keeps pulling the planets in towards the, the sun, gravity is that acceleration that causes it to do that. Otherwise, Earth would start flying off on its own, and then that would be horrible. Then we'd go flying away from the sun, we would freeze to death, we'd crash into other planets or other solar systems. So, yeah, what I need you to basically get out of this, this concept here, because there's, there's a lot here, and if, if I need to explain this in person, please stop the video and, and have me try to explain this again. But the basic concept is that it's always a center-seeking acceler acceleration. Velocity would want to travel along a straight line according to a tangent but the acceleration pulls it towards the middle. And so eventually what happens is this line starts to alter itself to match the acceleration, and it's now going this way. But then the acceleration, again, goes back towards the middle, which means that this line will begin to alter itself. Oops, I didn't want to move that one. Will begin to alter itself so that it matches the acceleration again. But as the velocity changes, the acceleration changes, and it just it keeps doing this ad nauseum in a circle, and I think, hopefully I made my point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on here. So, I got one more picture that kind of shows the concept, but I just need you to know that your speed will always be the same. And the numerical value of your velocity will always be the same. But because you're changing directions, you have a changing velocity. And if you have a changing velocity, you have a, 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 an acceleration, and they're perpendicular to each other. So, now, we wanna go one step further than that, because we can work with what's known as a centripetal force. That'll be Fc. And Fc is actually one of the big physics principles on your data sheet. I might have this listed a little bit later on in our notes, but since I'm thinking about it right now, I wanted to describe it. Um, property number two, physics principle number two, is uniform circular motion. And the way that uniform circular motion works is that you have an F net, but F net is radially inwards, meaning that there's always a force going inside. And hopefully that makes sense because if the acceleration is going towards the middle, then there should be a force going towards the middle. Remember how I gave that example of, of gravity, of the Earth going around the sun? Well, that's because there's a force of gravity keeping the Earth on its path. Right? And if I spin something around in a circle, there's tension in a rope that's keeping it, right? That's what this picture kind of describes, is that right here, the tension in the rope is breaking. But otherwise, the tension in the rope is always a force that goes back towards the middle. Break that force for some reason, and it'll all of a sudden go flying off at a tangent. So, Okay, so let's get to the math part, because I've talked about the theory a little bit here, and I can do that more later. Ah, here it was. Yep, here's the, the principle I wanted to describe, uniform circular motion. So there are two formulas that we have. And um, one of them is for velocity. And the way the velocity formula works, if it's going in a circle, is that your centripetal velocity is 2 pi r over big T. Now, I'd like to explain where this formula came from. If you recall from earlier, if you ever have uniform velocity, uniform, uniform motion where you're going the same speed, the formula for that is distance over time. However, you're going around a circle now. You're no longer going in a straight line, but we're now traveling in circular motion. Well, as you travel around in a circle, you really have a circumference. And the formula for circumference is 2 pi r. So that actually explains where your distance comes from. The distance that you're traveling in one rotation of a circle is 2 pi r. That's a circumference. And rather than using time, d over t, we're going to use capital T. t referring to period, because hopefully you're well familiar now with the idea of period being how long it takes for one revolution to happen. So in one revolution, you traveled a distance of a circumference. And the amount of time is known as your period. So that makes this new formula, 2 pi r over t. And so all we need to basically know is the radius of the circle you're traveling and how long it takes to go around that circle. Now, we can also calculate accelerations as well. And um, I don't really have a great way of kind of showing you where this formula right here came from. So you're just going to have to take my word for it. I can look up the, the process in a textbook if you'd like. 
But this is basically how we calculated acceleration in a centripetal direction. If you're going in a circle and you want to find the centripetal acceleration, it's equal to V squared over R. Or there's an alternate version, since we know that V is equal to 4 pi, or sorry, since V is equal to 2 pi R over T, if you replace this stuff inside there, you're basically being asked to square your velocity. And so if you square 2, you get 4. And if you square pi, you get pi squared. And if you square r, you'd get r squared. However, the reason why this is an r squared is that there's an r down here on the bottom, and it kind of cancels the squared version of that one. And, um, and then you also have to square t, and so t becomes your new denominator squared, and that's basically where this new formula came from. And so we have three new formulas we can basically work with. These are the three formulas, and they're only only ever used if you're traveling in a circle. Now, centripetal force, I need to add one more thing there. There actually is no such thing as a centripetal force. Um, a lot of people will misname this, and there's actually questions on this in Physics 30 often where you need to understand how centripetal forces work. But centripetal force is really not a force on its own. It's just the name we give to the net force when you're moving in a circle. And so often what ends up happening is when the only force that you have is the force of gravity, we call that the centripetal force. And so that's actually what's happening with our Earth going around the sun right now, is that gravity is keeping our Earth attached to the sun, but it's traveling in a circle. Because otherwise, the Earth would literally get sucked in towards the sun, and we would fry up, right? Let me draw that picture again. Here's the sun. I'll try to draw a better sun this time. I'm not sure that was any better. And now here's the Earth going around the sun, right? Well, if there was no circular motion, the Earth right here would just get sucked in towards the sun. But fortunately, we're already in motion. And so since our velocity centripetal is going this way, our force centripetal is pulling us towards the sun, but it's always pulling us in a different direction. So it wants to pull us towards my left, so eventually the Earth will actually be going to the left. But it means that the force centripetal will now be going down, so that means eventually we'll be traveling down. Hopefully you get that idea. Um, I'm getting off topic. The point I want to make is that there is no centripetal force. Centripetal force literally is your net force. It is the only force happening when you're going in a circle. So if you ever want to calculate your centripetal force, it could be equal to gravity. Or in other scenarios, it could be equal to tension. Or it could be equal to mass times acceleration. And so I want to do some math examples now for the next little while to kind of help illustrate some of these math examples. So I've got a whole bunch of them for us to try. Um, so you're going to need a calculator, and you're going to want to know your formulas. So let's give her a try. Imagine you're going through these roundabouts, right? We have so many of these in Lethbridge now, these, these traffic circles. Let's figure out your centripetal acceleration if someone drives 40 kilometers an hour in a traffic circle, and they don't brake. They just basically, they just give her, and they go around the circle. You probably felt this centripetal force before, because it's kind of what throws you into the door of the car sometimes, right? You probably can feel when the, when the person's taking the circle a little bit too quickly, right? So the formula for centripetal acceleration is AC, centripetal acceleration, is V squared over R. That's one of the formulas we need. So all we need to do in this example is just plug in our values, I, I, except this 40 kilometers an hour is not the right velocity. Um, first of all, that 40 kilometers an hour is a speed, and it's constantly changing, right? You were going this way, then you're going this way, then you're going this way. And so because your speed is changing, we should have an inward focusing acceleration. Um, but we need to convert it to meters per second. So I'm going to divide by 3.6 and get a meters per second value. So it looks like you're actually traveling 11.11, .11, basically 11.1 .1 repeating meters per second. And so that's what we're going to use. 11.1 .1 repeating squared, we divide by our radius. But you got to read carefully. It said the traffic circle was 120 meters across, which means my radius is only 60 meters, because I basically told you what the diameter was. So take that, square 11.1 .1 repeating, and divide by 60. And it means that we do have an acceleration. And the acceleration is 2.1 meters per second squared. However, the car itself is always going to be going 40 kilometers an hour. That's what makes this weird, is that the car itself is always going 40 kilometers an hour, but because we're going in a different direction, we have a centripetal acceleration, and we can calculate that amount. And that acceleration is always going inwards towards the middle. 
So if you're ever asked to give a direction, that direction is inwards, towards the middle of the circle. If it was going towards the out of the circle, you wouldn't have a circle anymore. Things would be flying off in different directions, right? I mean, when this car here eventually takes the off-ramp, then you're no longer traveling in a circle anymore. So there's example one. Um, if you have any questions, like I always suggest, um, re-watch the video clip, call me over, ask for help. Otherwise, I'm going to move on and try some more examples. Um, this is actually one of the ways that astronauts um, try to simulate gravity. I found this picture online to help illustrate it. As a way of simulating high accelerations, NASA astronauts use what's known as a centrifuge. And it basically, it spins things in circles like crazy, quite quickly around in circles, right? And uh, what they're hoping to do is help simulate how many Gs an astronaut has to undergo. Because if you recall from previous um, uh, questions we've solved, a G is basically how many 9.81s an astronaut is undergoing. And the human body can only withstand so much acceleration before blood doesn't flow to your brain anymore. And eventually, once blood doesn't flow to your brain, then you black out. And so I don't know what the number is, but humans usually pass out in a certain amount of Gs. Um, anyways, that's what they're trying to do in this simulator here, is give astronauts some experience with high accelerations, because they might undergo that when they're in outer space. So let's try this example here. Uh, it says uh, we want to find the centripetal force. Well, the way that centripetal force works is that it's really equal to your net force. There really is no such thing as a centripetal force. It's equal to your net force. But we know that according to Newton's second law, that your net force is your mass times your acceleration. But I'm going to put a little C there, because if we're going in a circle, it's a mass times a centripetal acceleration. And our centripetal acceleration, we can then replace that with, say, V squared over R. If we know our velocity and we know our radius, we could then use that to then solve for my centripetal force. Mass times V squared over R, which is acceleration. Uh, the problem, though, is, is as I look at this particular question here, I've been given a mass. Right? There's a mass there. And I've been given a radius, but I haven't been given a velocity. I've been given a revolutions per minute. What is a revolution per minute? What is that, what is that a unit of? It's actually a unit of frequency. Right? A revolution per minute is a frequency. Which means that I may not want to use this particular version of the formula. I may want to use the other acceleration value. If I can go back a few slides, we learn that acceleration is equal to v squared over r. But it's also equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. So I could replace the acceleration with 4 pi squared r over t squared. Now you might say, Chris, how did that make things better? You still need a mass. OK, we have a mass. You still need a radius. We have a radius. But you don't actually have a period. You have a frequency. Well, I can do one more thing. We know that a frequency is 1 divided by, a frequency is 1 over a period, or a period is 1 over a frequency. So what I could do is I could take this period right here and convert it to a frequency, and I'll just put the frequency up here instead. And that's kind of a clever little trick I can play, is that rather than it being on the top of the fraction, I'll just put it on the, or rather than it being on the bottom of the fraction, I will reciprocal it and put it on the top instead. And so rather than it having been t to the minus 2, because that's what happens when it's on the bottom, right? When t is on the bottom, you could then call that t to the minus 2. Right? T, t squared on the bottom, if you know your math, is actually a, a negative exponent. But rather than making a negative exponent, I could just trade out period and make it frequency. And so there, I've now built myself a new formula. The formula is mass times 4 pi squared times radius times frequency squared. The only problem is my frequency is in revolutions per minute. And revolutions per minute is not our standard unit. We really want this to be in hertz. So we need this to be revolutions per second. So if this thing spins around 15 times in a minute, if I divide that by 60, so 15 divided by 60, it means that it spins basically a quarter of a time in a second. Oh, did I do that right? Revolutions per minute, 15 times in a minute. If you do 15 times in 60 seconds, then that basically means to one time every four seconds. So really, that's my period, honestly. My period is four, right? Four, four seconds to, to rotate, right? Four seconds for one, eight seconds for two, 12 seconds for three. Keep that going. In 60 seconds, you'd have, you'd have 15 times. So 
Anyways, now that I have all of that, though, I think we're, we're basically ready to plug in some values. So here, let's calculate a force. We need to do 100 kilograms times by 4 and pi squared, which, by the way, may look very similar to what we did in a lab once, where we were trying to solve for gravity with pendulums. That 4 pi squared might look familiar. The, uh, the radius we were given was 8.80, and uh, our frequency was actually 0 0.25 hertz, and I'm going to square that. And so when I'm done, I have 100 times 4 times pi squared times 880 times by 0.25 squared, and I have a final value with two sig digs of 2.2 times 10 to the 3 newtons. And that would tell us how much force this astronaut right here is feeling. And they're going to feel it because they are getting flung into the side wall of this container, right? If you can imagine spinning around in this thing in circles, just like your friend who maybe takes the, the, the roundabout a little too fast, well, this, this person is getting flung into the side wall of the container pretty quickly. And so they're going to feel quite a bit of force there. Um, just because I can, maybe I'll just point out that this would have worked the exact same way as if I'd have used the original formula. And rather than having F squared right here, I brought it back down to T squared on the bottom. And then I think I calculated my period was 4 squared. So I could do the exact same thing. I should get the same answer. Just double check that yourself if you'd like to, right? Just pause the video. Double check that if you times by 0.25 squared, it's the same thing as dividing by 4 squared. So I'll divide that by 16 instead. And yeah, I got the same answer now. I still got 2.2. It's 2.171, but times 10 to the 3 newtons. Uh, one more question is, which direction is that? And the direction is always inward. Because if this doesn't try to pull you back towards the middle, you'd go flying off. So there's always a force pulling you towards the middle. Okay, let's try another example. This one's kind of an interesting one. Uh, let's say there's a curved stretch of highway, and uh, the car is trying to go around a curve. And um, I, I grew up in BC, so this one really resonates with me, because there are definitely some sections of highway in BC where you've got these mountain roads. And as you are trying to go around this mountain road, so this is kind of a top-down view, right? This is your car driving on your side of the highway. This is a top-down view of your car. Uh, the, the car, you basically need to keep the car on the road, right? And if you're not too careful, in theory, you could, basic, you could, you could maybe swerve and you could end up in oncoming traffic. And it, it's definitely possible that a, uh, that a vehicle that's going the other way, if you're not careful, if you can't maintain a nice tight radius, you're, you're going you're gonna to lose it, and you're going to go into oncoming traffic. Uh, this actually happened to me once before. I was driving on icy roads, and uh, there is a big, big curve right outside of Sparwood, British Columbia. And if any of you have been there, you've probably, you've probably been on this curve before. There's just a large, large curve, and it was icy. And I didn't realize how icy it was. And so as I was trying to drive my car around this curve, I was probably going 100 kilometers an hour or more, maybe. And I didn't realize how icy it was. And there was not enough friction on the ground. And eventually my car started veering into the oncoming lane because I, I literally could not keep my car on the line I wanted to. Because as much of a good driver as I like to think I am, if you don't have enough friction to keep you pulled towards the middle, according to Newton's first law, objects in motion stay in motion. And my car stayed in motion along its original trajectory. Now, I was really lucky there was no oncoming traffic. But I still remember this to this day. It still freaks me out when I think of that big curve around Sparwood there. Because, yeah, if, if there isn't enough friction to help pull me towards the middle, if my tires and the road don't have enough friction, then, um, then it's definitely possible that Newton's first law takes over and objects in motion stay in their trajectory. So that's what we're going to calculate in this question here. Um, I'm going to erase all the stuff here. And basically, I'm going to say, what is the minimum radius the car can travel without skidding? So you're traveling 110 kilometers an hour, and uh, we have a co coefficient of friction, which we learned about in our previous unit, meaning that the tires, uh, the tires are going to be what helps pull us towards the middle. So if I were to kind of draw the picture right here, the force of friction is going to be what keeps us centered. If it isn't for that force of friction, then we go flying off, right? So let's start building a formula. That's a real, a real key thing to what you've hopefully been learning about. If I want to build a formula, let's start with this. I'm going to use a centripetal force. But the, the only thing that my centripetal force is really equivalent to is the, is the force of friction. Right? If it isn't for the force of friction, 
then I go flying off. So really, that's how I'm going to start by building my formula. Uh, and another way of looking at it is my, my net force. The, the only net force I have is the force of friction. And centripetal force is just a fancy way of saying what is your net force when you're going in a circle. So that's kind of what allows us to put this together and say, since the only force we have is friction, and since we're going in a circle, FC equals FF. That's kind of what gets us started. And the more you do this, the more comfortable you're going to be trying to figure out how to begin. Because that's where a lot of students in physics, they, get, they struggle is they have no problem typing numbers into a formula once they're done making the formula, right? Go back here. When you need to type numbers into this formula here, if, if you're not very good at typing numbers into a formula, you're really going to struggle. Like, hopefully that's not the issue. The harder part is figuring out how to make your formula, right? How do you get there in the first place? So here's where we're going to start. FC equals FF. But we know that FC can also be written as MAC. And I know that the force of friction be, can be written as UFN. And I'm going to keep going past that. I'm going to keep substituting. Because I know that the acceleration centripetal is really V squared over R. And I know that my normal force is going to be equal to the force of gravity, which is mass times gravity. And so there, I've now built myself a new formula. And I mean, kids will sometimes ask, Chris, where are my formula sheet? Do I find this formula? Well, you, you don't. I mean, that's part of what makes physics so hard. Physics is hard. Hopefully you've learned that, and hopefully you're not thrown off and you're not intimidated where you're you're wanting to quit. But physics is hard because you have to figure out how to make yourself a formula, and then you have to problem solve and you have to critically think, and it's going to take experience and practice and trial and error, and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to get stuck, and that's okay. Right? That's how we learn how to do things. So one more time from the top, we know that our centripetal force will be equal to our force of friction because friction is what's going to keep us going in a circle. Our centripetal force is really my net force, which is mass times acceleration, but I'm going to use the subscript C because we're going in a circle. I also know that force of friction is Ufn from what we learned in our last unit. And if I keep doing substitutions here, I know that my acceleration centripetal is V squared over R. That's a new formula we learned today. I know that my normal force will be equal to gravity, and gravity is mass times gravity. So there we go. Now let's rearrange this to get our radius. To get radius by itself, we're going to bring this all the way up over here and all three of these values down, and it's going to make this formula here. mv squared over umg will equal r. That's how I got radius by itself rearranging. So now we finally have a formula. And I would say that that is nine-tenths of the battle. Because once you got to here, most kids are pretty good at this at this point in their, their, their schooling careers. They're, they've got the math skills needed to be able to like cancel mass on both sides. Because, by the way, you might notice, I didn't give you the mass of the car. It doesn't matter how heavy your car is. Mass is, mass is independent. If I were to ask you about a graph of uh, the radius that you can handle based on the mass of your car, it doesn't matter if mass is an irrelevant variable. The radius is actually dependent on your speed. It's dependent on the coefficient of friction and gravity. And this is why in my example where when I was taking that curve outside of Sparwood and it was icy and I veered into oncoming traffic, you, you can't tell me, well, Chris, you're just not a very good driver. Um, I can't control things. I can control my speed, but I cannot control the coefficient of friction. And as soon as the tires and the road lost their coefficient of friction, I was, I was kind of helpless. I was, I was at the mercy of basically Newton's first law traveling in a straight line. You could say, Chris, why didn't you turn the steering wheel? I was. I didn't turn the steering wheel. I didn't do anything, right? Because there was no friction between the tires and the road to, to do anything. So anyways, fortunately, I'm still safe because I'm here to tell you the story. Okay, uh, let's finish this. Our, our radius will be our velocity squared over the coefficient times gravity, which is going to be 110 kilometers an hour. Divide by 3.6 because I need meters per second. I'm going to square that. I'm going to divide by my coefficient, which was 0 0.60. And we are on Earth, so gravity is 9.81. There we go. We got our answer. Bear with me while I type it in. So as long as I didn't mistype anything, it means that the radius under which I can handle is 158 point something meters which I only get two sig digs, so basically I can handle a radius of about 160 meters. We probably should write that as 1.6 times 10 to the 2 meters. And that would tell me, under those conditions, this is how tight of a radius of a curve 
uh, this car can handle. And, and if I try to take a radius that's a little bit too tight, and I had to make a radius that was a little bit smaller than that, the, the car might not be able to handle that curve. Uh, one good example of this actually is NASCAR racers. You know how NASCAR or Formula One, they actually have to go around in an oval over and over and over again? Uh, they need to have a decent enough coefficient of friction between their tires and the road so they can make their turns. Um, I don't know that I can diagram this all that well, but basically here's a NASCAR oval, right? And as they enter turn one and turn two and turn three and turn four, they'd like to stay on their line. But what ends up happening is they can't always stay on the tightest turn radius because their car can't necessarily handle the speed all that well. And there's other factors in play. There's friction, there's drag, there's where the other racers are, but sometimes they have to take like a higher line. And by taking a higher line, they're not taking the fastest way through the oval because you really want to be on the inside of the oval the whole time, right? If you imagine that the oval has different lanes, if you could be on the inside lane or on the outside lane, you want to be on the inside lane because you're traveling less distance. But sometimes a car can't handle the most inside trajectory, and you have to kind of go a little bit higher. Right? That's not always the case. Sometimes there's not a problem at all, but that is, that is something to consider. Okay, um, I think I've covered my question here. So if you have questions, always stop the video and ask. Otherwise, I'm going to move on and try another example here. So uh, imagine that we have a mass on the end of a string, and we spin it in a vertical circle. So what that means is that here's kind of the middle, and this is somebody basically spinning it up and down in circles. And so there is a, uh, there's a mass right here at the top. And then eventually it'll be over here. Right? I'm spinning it in a circle. And then eventually the mass is down here at the bottom. And so as it rotates, basically, I don't know, it'd be like the person who's doing a lasso, right? And they're spinning something around in a circle over and over and over again, only we're just going straight up and down. And the question we've got now is to figure out the tension in the string. We want to know what is the tension in the string at different locations. And so first I want to talk about when this is at its highest point. When the mass up here is at its highest point, we really would like to know what sort of forces are acting on this mass. And so one of the forces acting on the mass is the force of tension, because isn't tension basically keeping this thing from flying off at an angle? Right? Because if there was no rope here, the object that's spinning in a circle would just go flying away. So tension is one of my forces. But there's also one more force. There's also the force of gravity, because gravity is pulling this down. And so what I can say here is that the free body diagram on this object looks like this. The force of gravity and the force of tension are really my two net forces. And you might say, hang on, if they're both acting in the same direction, wouldn't that mean that they would want to get pulled downwards? And that, that's exactly what happens. It wants to get pulled down. But since it's traveling this direction here, it'll eventually be going down. It's just going to take a little while for it to round the corner. So those are my two net forces. But I know that my two net forces are equal to my centripetal force. Because net force is centripetal force when you're going in a circle. And my centripetal force can be written as mass times acceleration centripetal. Long story short, if I want to figure out the tension in the rope, I have to do mass times my centripetal acceleration, and I have to subtract the force of gravity, which kind of makes sense because as this thing is heading to the top of the loop, this is where there'll be the least tension on the rope because gravity is kind of like countering it. So it's more or less um, like we might actually have no tension in the rope at the very top right up here. Because maybe gravity is actually pulling this down, and it'll barely go through the loop-de-loop. -loop. I actually have a loop-de-loop -loop question for us to answer later in the question set, I believe. But yeah, tension's pulling down, but so is gravity. So gravity is actually countering my tension. So uh, now I need to figure out how I want to build the rest of this formula, though. Because my mass times my acceleration, I could use v squared over r. But what I may want to use is the 4 pi squared r over t squared formula. I may want that one instead. And uh, the force of gravity is mass times gravity. So now that I've built this formula, let's look at our, all of our variables. We need to know a mass. And look, we have a mass, 50 grams. We need to know a 20 centimeter string. Well, that's the radius. And it says it did 10 circles in 15.7 seconds. Well, if you take 15.7 seconds and divide by 10, 15.7 right, divided by 10 means that it took 1.57 seconds to do one circle. Well, that is a period. And that explains why I chose to use the formula down here 
for pi squared r over t squared because I don't I don't know a velocity, but I sure know a period. So uh, let's start plugging in numbers. I think I have everything I need. The mass of the pendulum bob was 50 grams, but I got to put it into kilograms, so 0 0.050 times by 4 pi squared, and then times by my radius, which was 20 centimeters, which is 0 0.20 meters. I got to put it into meters. Then I have to divide all of that by my period, which it was 1.5 seconds, 1.57 squared. That's how many seconds it takes to rotate. But in this case here, I'm going to have to subtract mass times gravity. And so mass was 0 0.050 times 9.81. And so there's going to be slightly less tension at the top of the rope because gravity is acting against, well, because, because gravity is pulling me back down, basically. I'm going to show you in a little while here how, how that actually differs at the bottom of the rope. But first, I need to find our answer. So hopefully I didn't make any mistakes here. Hmm. Well, I'm going to double check my math here, but I got a value of negative 0.33 newtons. And uh, I just want to double check as to why I have that value. So I'm just going to double check my math, make sure I didn't type in anything wrong. But I think I actually remember why I, why I designed this that way. Subtracting 0 0.050 times 9.81. Yeah, no, I got a negative a, a negative number for newtons. So hopefully you got the same thing. Now, now we need to explain why. And I mean, I'm really going through the same thought process as you right now. I'm trying to walk you through. Why would we have a negative number? And it's not because it's pulling us backwards. It's the fact that we actually don't have any tension in the rope. Right? What's actually happened in this case here is that as this object has been spun in a circle, the rope has lost all tension. And rather than reaching this total point right here, what's probably happened is it's kind of like flopped like kind of around the, the circle like this. It hasn't actually been able to maintain its full circle because it's not traveling fast enough. It needs to travel faster in order to be able to go all the way around the loop-de-loop. -loop. I have an example of that later. Maybe I should try to describe that one here. Let's go to this one here. Here's my roller coaster question. If you ever go on an old-fashioned roller coaster and it's your job to basically go around like this, um, what could end up happening is if you don't have enough speed going around the circle, that um, perhaps what happens is you go like this, and you get all the way up to here, and then you fall. And I've got a lab we're going to do where we're going to shoot Hot Wheels around a loop-de-loop. -loop. And what ends up happening is if you don't send them with enough speed, enough velocity coming in here at first, they don't make the full loop-de-loop. -loop. They come part of the way through, and they kind of collapse. And that must have been what happened in this example here, is that the amount of tension is negative, because there is there is no tension in this rope here. It can't handle it. There, there's not enough to overcome gravity. Gravity is so big that tension can't tension can't um, can't deal with it very well. So, um, yeah, let's let's move on and try the second example because I want to show you how something's a little different here. At the lowest point, I'm actually going to keep all the work on here. On at the lowest point, as this thing comes around the bottom of the circle, let's talk about how that one would work here. Well, in this example here, gravity is pulling you down, but in this case up here, tension is pulling you up. And what ends up happening here that's a little bit different, and I think this helps illustrate why we had different value, is that tension and gravity are going in opposite directions. And what that's going to mean then is that since ultimately my net force is pulling me backwards back up again, because if it's not, then this thing's going to break and go off to the side, it means tension is winning. It means that I now need to change my formula and make it a negative force of gravity because gravity is now going the opposite direction of my tension. And so on this new example here, where we're now founding this at the bottom of the rope, we're actually going to have more tension at the bottom of the rope. That's actually where the most tension is, is at the bottom of the rope. Because what's going to happen is gravity is now acting in the opposite direction of tension, and you now need to add it to the other side. And if I now take the exact same formula I just did, and I add mass times gravity, no longer am I going to get a negative tension, but now I'm going to get a positive tension. And this could mean that if my rope can't handle that much tension, it might actually snap. No one ever snaps the rope at the top because gravity is kind of countering you, but you could at the bottom. So I'm going to do this one more time, and it's the exact same calculations, 
but now I'm going to add mass times gravity instead. So divide by 1.57 squared and add 0 0.050 times 9.81. And in this example here, I have a tension amount of 0 0.65 newtons. And so the difference here is that on the way up, as it was going through the upwards trajectory, it apparently wasn't going very fast. There's no tension left in the rope. There's no slack, or there is slack in the rope. And hopefully this thing will be able to maintain a circular trajectory and won't just like plop down and fall straight down on the ground. But on the bottom, you actually get more tension in the rope because the rope has to pull you back up again, right? The rope has to pull you back up again, but gravity is trying to keep you down. So you actually end up needing to have more tension in your rope. So hopefully that made some sense. Um, if not, uh, call me over, ask some questions, but I'm going to move on because I've got a few more examples left and I'm at 50 minutes and I want to finish in a bit. Uh, here's, here's a diagram that kind of illustrates how this would work. If you are at the top of the rope, you get to subtract the, the amount of, uh, of, of gravity. But if you're at the bottom of the rope, you actually have to add extra gravity. Now, if you are actually on both sides over here, uh, gravity doesn't actually take place anymore. And the reason why is that your net force is traveling inwards. But if gravity is, gravity is traveling downwards, it's not in the same direction. This is a Y and an X. And if y and x are not in the same plane of motion, it really doesn't affect anything. But since everything is in the y direction at the top and bottom, then, then you either need to add extra gravity at the bottom or subtract it off the top. So let me try another example. This is the one that I was kind of leaning to here, is these roller coasters. At the very, very, very top of this roller coaster undergoing a loop-de-loop, -loop, if this thing doesn't go fast enough through here, what can end up happening is it's, it's, it's going to fall out of the loop-de-loop. -loop. And so we need it to have some velocity at that point there. Right? So let's actually talk about the free body diagram right here. The free body diagram at this point right here is basically really straightforward. All, all that we have right here is a uh, force pulling us back down to the middle. And that force that's pulling us back down to the middle is gravity. There is no rope in this example here. So literally to build my formula here, I'm going to say that my F net is gravity because gravity is wanting to pull me back down again. But I know that my F net is another way of talking about centripetal acceleration. And so that could be mass times gravity. But I know that my centripetal acceleration is mv squared over r. I'm kind of skipping some steps. You remember how this is equal to mass times acceleration, but your acceleration is v squared over r? And one of the cool things here is that we don't actually need to care about mass because mass is on both sides of the equation. So if I want to figure out the minimum velocity the roller coaster is going to need to have, here's my new formula. V squared over R will have to equal G. I'm going to times both sides by R and square root. And now we've built ourselves a formula. This is how much speed the roller coaster better be traveling with. And if it's not traveling with enough speed, it won't make it all the way through the loop-de-loop. -loop. It won't be able to handle that radius. So it's actually pretty straightforward. It's the square root of gravity, which is 9.81, times by the radius of our loop, which was 50 meters. 9.81 times 50 square rooted. And we're going to need to have a velocity of at least 22 meters per second. At least. I'm going to say greater than or equal to. Right? Our velocity needs to be greater than or equal to 22 meters per second. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you can't make that radius and you, you come falling out of the track. Maybe I'll try to make sure I use my Hot Wheels tracks to illustrate how this works here. But yeah, hopefully that made sense there for that velocity. The mass, by the way, doesn't matter, which is good because what happens if you have extra weight in the roller coaster car or you, or you run the roller coaster loop without any weight on it? Hopefully mass doesn't make a difference and you can actually see that mass is in both equations so it cancels. So hopefully that one made sense. Um, I'm gonna go through and get to my last example now. Uh, the last example basically builds on this one. So that's why I'm kind of shorting this one here because I, I want to go to the next one because it builds on it. We are not going to build a roller coaster that only travels 22 meters per second because that is just too much of a margin of error. So what it suggests is we better have a minimum velocity 50% higher just to make sure that everyone's safe. So I'm going to take my final value of 22.147234. Or five, nine. That's what I got in my calculator. And I'm going to times it by 1.5, which is basically 50% more. And if I times it by 1.5, 
Now let's send this thing through with a speed of 33 meters per second. I'm going to store the entire answer as letter A in my calculator, but it's 33.22085. We're, we're going to make sure this, this thing goes a little bit faster than, than, than normal, right? And um, what's going to end up happening in this case is I'm actually asking you to calculate how much normal force the track is going to exert on the cars at the top of the loop. And that may seem kind of weird. Let me go back to the picture right here and explain why there's normal force right here. Let's say that there's no track. Let's say that all of a sudden right here, the track is broken. <laughs> right? Well, all of a sudden, if there was no track right here, the car would go flying that direction right there. And so what's really important to know is that the track itself is actually, it's upside down compared to what we're normally considering it, but there's normal force pushing back this way here. And the track is actually what's keeping the car in line. Because yeah, if, if that makes hopefully some sense to you here, if all of a sudden the track were to go around like this, and then it were to stop, you'd go through the track, and then you'd launch that direction there. But because there's more track right here, the normal force is actually the track pushing back on the, on the cars, keeping them from flying off, and it keeps them going in their circle. So there's actually normal force. And by the way, if there's normal force, there's friction as well, which we can actually link this into friction questions. So let me show you how this is going to look here then. At the top of the loop right here, how this changes then is your track right here. We have gravity pulling you downwards, but we also have a normal force keeping you from flying out of the track upwards on like some sort of crazy kamikaze space ride where you're going off into space, right? We don't want that. We want you to stay in line with the track. So normal force and gravity are actually going the same direction. So that means that your gravity and your normal force are your net forces. And if I want to do some more substitutions, gravity would be mass times gravity. Your normal force, I'll just leave like that. And our net force will be mass times acceleration. Now we want to isolate for normal force, so I'm going to bring mg to the other side and give us this. F net, Fn, normal force, is equal to mass times your centripetal acceleration minus mass times gravity. Just like we did in the last question here, we're going to have to subtract off mass times gravity. And then for the last thing here, our mass will now have to be times by V squared over R to make it a centripetal acceleration. And then we'll subtract mass times gravity. Now in this case here, when we're now looking for the normal force, the amount of normal force that the, the track itself is pushing back on us with will depend on how heavy the people are inside there. So we actually are going to need to know a mass in order to calculate this. So I didn't actually use mass last time, but it was in the question. It was 4,800 kilograms. So just as a reminder, when we're plugging in some values, we do know that mass value. It's 4,800. So let's give this a try. The mass value is 4,800. My velocity is, for me, letter A in my calculator. And our radius was 50 meters. And then we're going to subtract 4,800 times 9.81. Now here's the deal. If we get a negative number, this is not good. Because if we get a negative number, this should indicate to us that we have um, uh, we don't have enough normal force. It means there is no normal force acting on the track. And that would mean that the car, if this is the loop right here, that would mean that the car tried to go through the loop and it like fell out. And it's now a free body where there is no normal force because it's not touching the track anymore. So let's give this a try. 4,800 times by your A value squared, divide by 50. And then I'm going to minus 4,800 times by 9.81. And fortunately, I still have some normal force left over. I have a normal force of 58860 newtons, which will be 5.9 times 10 to the 4 newtons. So that's good. The track at that point there needs to be able to withstand some force, because if it doesn't, this train right here, one of two things will happen. It'll either fall right out, or if there's so much normal force, it might try to break through the track, right? And so if you don't build a very good track right here, there's going to be some force applied, and this thing's going to want to try to break through. I didn't draw that very nicely. Let me do that one more time, because I'm almost done my lesson. I think I can spare a minute and, and draw it nicer. Here's my track. It looks like this. And the car, if it doesn't come with enough speed, could do this. And that would be horrible, because that means you're just going to crash. 
Uh, or what's going to happen is it's going to ride right along right here. But if it has too much speed, it could actually break right through the floor. Remember how, how as we were describing normal force before? If I had a table and there was an object on the table, we talk about normal force pushing up because we said, well, gravity's pulling down, normal force is going to be pushing it up because otherwise this thing would be falling through the floor. Well, it's the same scenario, only upside down. Now, these people right here, tip your head upside down, here's a person, and um, this person right here is, is, from their perspective, they need this floor underneath them to save them from crashing away. So, otherwise they'd go along the blue trajectory. What we'd really like is the green trajectory where they go all the way through the circle. So, we now know how much normal force is required for that. Now, let's say we do it for the bottom of the track. Well, at the bottom of the track, it's almost the exact same math. Let's draw a free body diagram. At the bottom of the track, again, what's going to happen here is there's a track right here, and they're about to come down the track this way here. And if this section of the track is not very stable, they're going to go flying right through it. Right? They're going to be coming down pretty quick, and if the, if the track is not built solid up to code, they'll go crashing right through the floor. And so therefore, at this point right here, just like we normally have had, there's a normal force going one way and a gravitational force going the other way, which means they're now going opposite directions. So this is kind of cool. I don't even have to change most of my math. All I have to do is recognize that my force of gravity is now going in the opposite direction of my normal force. Normal force was going up. My centripetal net force was going up, but gravity is pulling me down. So I just need to throw a minus sign on here which means I throw a minus sign right here, which means you're actually adding and adding and adding. So all that changes this time is you're now adding extra gravity on top, which means that you better have the strongest part of your loop-de-loop -loop right at the bottom. The top of the loop-de-loop, -loop, yeah, it needs to be strong, but the bottom part of your loop-de-loop -loop right here needs to be able to withstand a lot of normal force. So let me try this one more time and then we're basically done. 4,800 times by my A value squared, divided by 50. But now I need to add 4,800 times 9.81. And that gives me a value of 153036, which will be 1.5 times 10 to the 5 newtons. And so clearly we need, uh, we need more force at the bottom here. And that's kind of what this diagram way back here illustrated. If I can go back there and end our lesson on this, because I'm just over an hour, that's about where I want to end is that at the top of a trajectory, you have to actually subtract off gravity. But at the bottom of the trajectory, you either have more normal force or you have more tension because you have to try to force something back upwards. And if you're forcing something back upwards, you're fighting against gravity. Gravity's trying to keep you back down. And so for you to get pulled back towards the middle, you're gonna need a higher centripetal force, which means you're gonna need a lot of tension in the rope. So this rope right here has to be its strongest at the bottom. or the track of the roller coaster has to be the strongest at the bottom. So, okay, I believe that's it. That's my last question. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to do Kepler's Laws as a group, or, or whatever day it is that we're going to do Kepler's Laws. We're going to do that as a group lesson. And so if you have any questions on this, can you please make sure you write them down and, and save them to ask me later? Uh, I strongly recommend you should re-watch this video. You should do practice questions. If you're not doing my practice assignments, you really should. Because that's how you get practice using these formulas. If you just watch once or twice, that's probably not sufficient. Uh, make sure you ask me for some practice questions. But I'm going to wrap up the video. Um, uh, as always, um, we'll, we'll chat soon. And um, thanks for watching, everybody.